All right. Um, our topic today is the power of fellowship. It's part two. I did part one two weeks ago, and I, I, I would like to just restart the concept, then we'll move into the other things we haven't covered as yet. The reason why I called it the power of fellowship is that when we fellowship, there's something extra or a bonus that God gives for people when they gather together. Now, it's not clearly defined in one sentence, but it's very clearly referenced through all of the Bible things that they did. The concept of coming together in fellowship was actually established in the Old Testament, and it was actually established from the, uh, from the peace offering, where they, it was the most common of the feasts. All of these things were feasts, and it was the most common feast that they had is where they, they chose, as we covered last week, the responsibility was on each family, and they would choose the most spotless and best of the sacrifice they had in their herd, particularly the sheep. They would offer the sheep up for a sacrifice to God, and the, because the leader of that household chose the animal, it was up to him the quality of the choice. And this concept of leadership and all these things, this parallels right through it. And if I explained everyone, we'd have another part again or two. But the reality is that it was a choice of offering their best. Transferring that through as a principle into fellowship today, we give the Lord the best of our time, not the leftover of our time. We give the Lord the first choice of our desire not what fits in, because that's the whole principle of how the Lord works with us. So with that point established, a couple other points I made, uh, I particularly referenced walking in the light out of John 1, and if we, if we walk as in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and his blood cleanses us from all sin, which is just this concept of being part of a fellowship as a cleansing, purifying process, as well as the spiritual inputs that come in from the other side uh, equally very powerful. I'd like to take up a couple of points. One will be in Hebrews, Hebrews 10.22. You might like to turn there. The notes I'm reading from are the same notes I handed out with the last one. They haven't changed, but th there will be more to here today if you didn't get them. There's three particular references we can bounce around to understand this principle of what fellowship really means to the Lord, what fellowship actually signifies. Fellowship is not like the gathering of a club. Fellowship has nothing to do with the gathering of a club. Fellowship is, another word for fellowship is communion. We have a common unity with God and each other. Gathering together is almost like a family gathering and because it's considered in the Bible, was, the co concept was of a feast. There's quite a few references in the New Testament of our fellowship and the gathering as being feasting in the things of the Lord. They're called love feasts, or when you feast, when you eat at the Lord's table. There's a whole series of things which can develop. And again, that would be another talk on just simply the concept of the feast or dining with the Lord. But there are three points that I'm going to raise. One here is in Hebrews. The other one is actually the communion verses. And the other one I'll reference is the sheep and the goats. Why? Because they're exactly the same principle. And that's why they're in the Bible. They're here to teach the church that there is a, a structure of priority for you as a spirit-filled person to walk in the Lord. If we go back in our mind... And we understand when we were witness to, we were told, we heard in testimony today about the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. All of us had to make decisions we didn't want to make necessarily. They were against the grain, they were against logical thought. The idea of getting baptised in water, of turning religious, turning up at meetings seen as a religious thing, all of these things were anti the original concepts that we would have had in our heart and mind for the way we wanted to live our life. They, they just didn't gel in with the choices we would naturally make. So when we got baptised, we realised that getting baptised, receiving the Spirit, that was God's plan for salvation. And if we didn't exercise that plan, we couldn't be saved. So now we're very strong on this because we receive, we understand it, we know scripturally how it works. In fact, we know principally from the scriptures how it works. We've got a lot to talk about. 
We had a lot of scriptural understanding to back our case. But not only that, we've got a, a lot of fellowships all around the world in a variety of languages, variety of countries, where this is a common experience proven by God. So we're on really good ground. We're not talking about what we believe, what we think, what we feel. We're talking about what God has done, is doing, and will do if we continue on. So that, that was a, a big heart changer for all of us. It sort of set us back, reality hits, and we go on. But the second point of the salvation message is to overcome. It's not, it's not just receive the Holy Spirit, you're saved forever. There's a, a lifestyle which goes with actually the Holy Spirit. There's a lifestyle and a, a priority structure, same as when you get married, the lifestyle changes. You get a priority, you get a partner. Things turn around. Uh, then you have your children or whatever. Then there's even further changes. But there's a priority scripture and that talks about this uh, structure. And these priority scriptures, they give details. And we'll be talking perhaps in a couple of weeks on relationships because the Bible talks about relationships and how they should work, how they should form and the type of relationship which God can bless and the ones he can't bless because some are according to his word and some aren't. He can't bless the ones not according to his word because when it's according to his word, you're stepping into where the blessings are. It's like fellowship. You're stepping in under the Lord's umbrella and we're getting the benefit of being protected by the umbrella or the, if you like, being in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Not only is the Spirit in us, it's in all of us. And when they gathered together with their feasts, there was a moving of the Spirit which never occurred the same way that was in their homes or in the other things they did. There was a particular, there's a word in the English language called synergy. And if you got one and one and you, multi, you put them together, you, you sort of got two. But synergy says that there's another force at work that when one and one come together, you get actually more than two. There's a multiplier that works some way that people don't necessarily understand and you can end up with three or four or five. In fact, the Lord talks about synergy but not using that word when he said that any man who gives up father, mother, family, houses, jobs, whatever for the Lord's sake, <coughs> not only will they have eternal life, but in this lifetime they'll have a hundredfold more. See, that's synergetic. That means one gets turned to a hundred. Not one by one, it's one gets turned into a hundred. That's synergy. And there's a whole series of principles which are synergenic, and I won't keep using that word because we're not common to it, but it just simply means blessing. Blessing is something given to you that you're not worthy of outside of just the normal ebb and flow of life and the, the other laws of the universe. Every action is an equal and opposite reaction. Law of the universe, it's a multiplier which then goes past that. Being in fellowship goes past what the Lord says. And that's why it's important to understand it. So let's have a look. Fellowship actually unifies us. You might think you're unified, but a lot of times Christianity is about, you think, oh, I agree with that. I believe in Acts 2.38. I believe in this. I believe that, you know, the Holy Spirit's here. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in healing. I, I'm really good. But believing is not what God wants. God wants believing to turn into action. Okay, action. Agreeing with things, Satan agrees with everything we read. He just doesn't like it. But Satan agrees with it, but it hasn't done him a world of good. In fact, it hasn't done him any good because being in agreement doesn't bring you good. It's actually the process of doing where the blessing comes. So when we gather together, the Lord's able to multiply spiritual principles in a way which he can't do when we're individually at home, regardless of what we agree with, because there's a job which gets multiplied and it's in the presence of people that God multiplies this and brings further learning. Hebrews 10 verse 22, he says here, let us draw near with a true heart. Interestingly, a true heart is no different to the other concept of communion or fellowship where in the Old Testament with the feast, he said, pick out the best of your flock because that's going to be your sacrifice. A true heart is the best of your personal ability to give. A true heart means you're doing it for the right reason because you want to. And it, it's not a task or a burden. It's when it becomes a burden, it doesn't work for you. It's when it's volunteered that the Lord's able to bring the most 
to do it. So let us draw near with a true heart, which is a desire to offer in full assurance of faith, not just agreed upon, but acted upon. See, full assurance of faith means faith means you do it. I come here with full assurance of faith. How? By coming here. I do it. Because why? Because that's what the Lord wants. The full assurance of your faith means that you're fully assured that God responds to his promises. And it, there's nothing less than that. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, meaning having the doubts and the fears and the interests, or if you like, the lure of natural life being cleansed from you. Come, offer the Lord your best sacrifice, which is you. Make yourself available. Let the Lord work. And the words here, even though they're referring in principle to how it was, but this is written to the Hebrews. These are all Jews. It's written to a group of people who are now 40, 50 years old and they're walking the Lord, maybe even longer. They've got a whole new set of problems. But they're getting, they're getting into the stale bread of life. They've already heard the word. They've already done this. They've already done that. They already knew about the gifts. They've already done the Roman stuff. They've already done the 1 Corinthian stuff. But they're getting old and sluggish spiritually. So there's a different style of writing for them. And that style of writing is probably a good style for our church because we are an older church. Our fellowship is 50, 60 years old now, probably longer for some. We got past all the uh, infant difficulties of a fellowship, even though one or two still remain. We still have new people problems because they come with problems, the Lord fixes them. But as a group of people, we gotta think as mature people think in the things of the spirit. And this is why these things are written because they're written to people who need to be mature, not only in their thought, but actually transferring that into spiritual action. So having our uh, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He says in verse 23, let us hold fast remaining sure. Don't give up on it. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. The profession of our faith are the actions of true believers. Not just speaking. Speaking is part of it. It's actually doing it. Profession's like a whole way of life. He said without wavering. All right, we do have our bad moments. Everyone does. But that's not what the point is. Without wavering is making a reference to becoming a lifestyle where wavering is actually a way of life. It's no longer just an event in the middle of a trouble. It's something that actually becomes a pattern of living you shift into. A wavering pattern. A pattern that doesn't quite involve fellowship anymore. A pattern that doesn't involve using the gifts anymore. A pattern that doesn't use wit uh, witnessing and reading and a lot of the other things. It's just simply getting enough of the Lord into your head by listening that you feel good about the Lord and yourself and that's where you shut down. And the Lord's saying, that doesn't work. You, you've already got the spirit. You've already done the hard bit. Don't fall back to a pattern that doesn't work. Move forward like you're as close to the Lord you're ever going to be. The Lord returns around the corner he's saying, stick in the thing that works. And this is being written 2,000 years ago because these people weren't sticking in. They were moving on with their thinking and actions. So he says here, let us hold the fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Why? For he is faithful that promised. Let us consider one another. How can you consider one another when fellowship's not part of your life? Consider one another and to provoke. Well, how do you provoke someone when you're not part of their life and you're not present with them? See, there's a whole series of thoughts here that when they get analysed, you realise that there's a definition of very strong clarity being presented, which we can abide by. Let us consider one another. Let's provoke one another unto love and to good works. You can't do that if you're not amongst the brethren. You can't do that if you're not amongst the brethren. This is something which is done through fellowship. And a desire to fellowship, the same as your desire to receive the Holy Spirit, your desire to fellowship now should be the same intensity you peaked at before you received the Holy Spirit. There's, because it's a way of life. It's not a club. This is a way of life for us. We're walking in the Spirit. He goes on to explain why, which is really good. And we'll, we'll cover that without me saying it first. 
He says in verse 25, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Now, there's probably a debatable way of interpreting this, but what's expected from fellowship is that we can provoke one another and that we can encourage one another. Is this only talking about Communion Sunday? Well, we're going to have a look at Communion Sunday and see that he has another take on that too. And it doesn't talk about Communion Sunday being the, the beginning and end of fellowship. In fact, it goes on to express a whole series of thoughts which are the same as this, that being together is about provoking and assisting and helping and keeping in the flow of life itself, the spiritual, keeping the spirit flowing. And he says, but exhorting one another, setting an example, both in word and deed, and he said, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So much the more, what's that mean? So much, what is supposed to happen more when you see the day approaching? See, this is about context. The Bible is written with context. This isn't referring to something else. It's referring to fellowship. It's referring to gathering together. There's a context. And in context, as we go, say we go to Corinthians, and we look at the gifts of the Spirit, there's a context to the gifts of the Spirit. And there's a context which helps us work out that the gifts or the time of the gifts are not the time of prayer. The time of gifts where it's about speaking in tongues, interpreting the tongue, having prophecy, that's not about the prayer line. That's actually about the time of the gifts. How do we know that? Because of the context to the whole writing, which defines what it all means. There's a context to these words about fellowship so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day and what is going to be the more? Fellowship, assisting one another, encouraging one another. Well, that's what this is about. This is where it is. Even more so as you realise we're getting to the end of the age. So we, we get this sort of a bit of a shove saying that more fellowship is actually essential as we get closer to the end. But it's interesting. This next verse to me is a slayer. If you love wisdom, this is a slayer. If you don't like wisdom, you'll just push it off as something else. He says for, verse 26, for, the word for is a conclusion. In all the grammar, in all the languages around the world, there are words which conclude on what's said before, which gives us a meaning to the context. The word for is a conclusion, a conclusion to what's said. But the context isn't in the sense of worldliness. The context is in the sense of fellowship. And I, I, I'm probably being a little bit tricky in one sense, because if you don't like how this goes and you make your mind up, I'm inventing this, the next step we get, you're going to realise that you've actually deceived yourself. It's actually talking about what I'm saying it is. And that'll make it even harder to digest because you've just fobbed off the Lord. Then you're going to fob him off again. It doesn't work well when you... We're not people who fob the Lord off. We're people who realise that we can do more, but we're not slaves. We can offer more, but we have also God-given responsibilities. We have families we have to care for. We have incomes we have to earn. We've got houses that need painting and maintenance, lawns that need mowing, and when your wife finishes doing that, you might have time to make her a cuppa. That, that's my motto. You might have time to make her a cuppa. Anyway, we have all these things happening which the Lord knows, and they're all allowable as part of life. But when it comes to building the after necessities of our natural life, the Lord talks about fellowship not fitting in but our natural life should be fitting into the concepts of fellowship. It actually flips it over. Why? Because the eternal life's about living forever. Living in the flesh is about getting to death and having nothing else. This is why the Lord talks this way. He says, for if we sin willfully, what does it mean to sin willfully? That means to knowingly do something the Lord doesn't want you to do. But what is the context? There's no context to sin here. This is not about robbing banks or smoking dope. This is not about drinking. The context is already set. So in relationship to the topic for conclusion, if we sin willfully, meaning sin meaning we reject God's way and choose our own willingly, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Very simply put is, if you don't realise that overcoming is just as essential as receiving the Spirit, and you fob off 
the knowledge of how overcoming works and the principles behind it, God said, I can't do any more for you. This is the context. And you can debate the context, but this is the context. Read the whole chapter. There's nothing else there. This is not just one verse in the middle of nowhere. God doesn't write verses in the middle of nowhere. Part of our strength of a church is that we learn to face the reality of why God says things and we incorporate it into our belief structure and we build it. And that's why the church is healthy. And that's why after 60 or 70 years, we haven't moved away from the salvation message. We haven't moved away from the gifts of the spirit, but there's so many people who have actually moved away from the church because this is a step they don't get. This is a step where they just can't swallow because it seems not to their taste. Too many of us want freedom that the Lord doesn't give us. We want to be free from the responsibility of serving our brothers and sisters. And Lord says, sorry, it's not on. I don't give you that. It's not a task. It's not a bad news story. It's simply, if you walk in the spiritual way, God will, f God will feed you. God will clothe you. God will give you things that make that work for you. Now, we have examples. Sometimes we can be unwell, and that's fine. We can be on holiday. Some of us have long service leave. Some people hop in their van and travel around for three months. We're not talking about those things. We're talking about choices we make on a day-to-day -day basis where we have a, a freedom to fellowship and we choose not to. And when you get to my age, or even older, it can be easy to hide behind your age. Ah, oh, I've got something that aches, I can't come. Or let me tell you, I've got everything that aches and I come. I'll give you some examples as well. Last week I spoke about uh, Brother Bob Osborne. You might remember I've mentioned a little bit about him. Some of you knew him. When he came to the church, he was roughly down to three weeks to live. He had multiple myeloma, which is blood cancer. He had brittleness in his bones. The cancer was in his bones. Um, he, he was finished. He had no life. So in that process, he came to me and asked if he could put his mattress in the floor on the Sunday meeting, and he wanted to lie on it. And I had no objection, so he, w he, just, he understood without any knowledge that fellowship was paramount. He just had that awareness that you had to be where God's people were. He didn't ask me to come round to his house to pray. He didn't ask any of that. He said, I will go where the Lord's people are. He understood the Lord's people had something and he went and he was on his mattress. Now the Lord restored his health back to him and he got nine years and he brought, I don't know how many dozens of people he brought to the meetings as a result, but he had to test me that he would not miss a meeting regardless. And sometimes he was very ill in hospital. He obviously didn't come. But if he had a choice and he could turn up and he'd lie on his mattress at the back and he, he had a little quiet little chat to me. He said, oh, look, Brad, they've given me three weeks. He said, if I die in a meeting, just put the mattress on top of me. He wasn't joking. He meant that because he thought he was going to die. That was one example. Now, it wasn't all that long ago we had a sister here by the name of Sue Carson. You might remember her. You know what she made a priority in her life? fellowship. She got to every prayer meeting. She got to Sundays, midweeks, you name it. She was there. She was terminally ill for several years and should have been dead several years ago because she put a perspective on her life where some people would see it as fanatical, but that wasn't, Sue wasn't a fanatical person. She did a lot of bold things like driving to Adelaide when she was terminally ill and, and coming back. She did it because she could do it, not because she was pushing the boundaries. She did it because in here, she knew that God was with her and she did that. And when she finally got on her deathbed, I think it was four years after she should have gone, she'd already set the example that when you give God the priority, your life is extended. She got bonus time out of it and in that bonus time she witnessed to people, she did stuff, she was a great support for myself and the ministry, she was a good support for our meetings. And I can go on with numerous other people. The interesting thing is of all the people, Sue Hanfling, a prime example. Again, a year or two to live, she got 14, 15, 16 years or something. Why? Sue got to every meeting. They, some people understand that meetings are where it's not that you've got the Holy Spirit, therefore nothing happens outside of that. 
It's not that way at all. As I said, there's a synergy or a multiplier which works. When you get that worked out, your life improves dramatically. Your life changes. God starts doing some of the stuff you struggle to do and he, he gets that done for you. Then you're free to pursue some of the spiritual things that are required. And that's why I always encourage people. And I say this in a way, it's not about condemnation. It's not about judging yourself. It's not about feeling guilty. But if you've got a choice to fellowship and you choose not to, that's a bad choice, amen? That's a bad choice. God filled you with the Spirit to give you a new life. He didn't fill you with the Spirit to give you better worldly life. He gave you stuff spiritually to give you a better spiritual life. And in turn, by using the spiritual things he gives you, the rest of your natural life improves dramatically. Now, I'd like, with that context in mind, and maybe some of these things a little bit raw in your thinking, let's go to another verse where these things are displayed with the same clarity. 1 Corinthians 5, I'll start at, just moving into the word communion. There's sort of this understanding that we all got to get to the communion meeting. Why? Why do we have to get to the communion meeting as opposed to, say, Wednesday, Tuesday, Friday, Saturday's activity? Why is it? Oh, because we take the bread and the grape juice. I got some very, very bad news for you. The bread and grape juice are worth absolutely zero spiritually. Absolutely zero. They are tokens or emblems of a responsibility which is equally achieved by coming to the meeting. Now, on the Sunshine Coast, we'd been up there from 1985 to 1995. On the Sunshine Coast, I realised that people were just turning up simply, they'd done the bread, they'd done the grape juice, and it was off. They used to go home after the first meeting. So I swapped it around and we made the second meeting the communion meeting. You know what happened? Three months later, they're all turning up at the second meeting and I had the same pattern. That meant that the people were only turning up to go through a Catholic-based mechanism. By, by Catholic-based, I don't mean the understanding of it, but the process was a habit of being seen to do something, therefore it makes you clear. There's another term we can consider, Sunday Christians would equally be as effective to that process if that's how you think. So let's have a look as we move into these things because you know why? Just like Hebrews itself explains, just like Hebrews, the conclusion's identical. Just like the sheep and goats, which is uncomfortable till you work it out, it's got exactly the same storyline. Let's have a look. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 4. Communion is fellowship based, built on servitude, built on God cleansing us because of our servitude, not on the fact that we've done the right thing. Taking the bread and the grape juice is not doing the right thing. It's a process of looking at yourself and identifying what the Lord wants you to do and being in agreement that you're actually doing it, not being in agreement that you agree with it. We can all agree that we agree with it, but that's not what God wants. There's so many casualties who agree with everything God said who never get any further. It's the doers. You've heard that word, it's the doers that overcome, not the hearers or the agreeers. 1 Corinthians 5, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together and in my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus to deliver such a one, he goes on now about a discipline. But why I've got this verse here, this fellow who he's referring to is actually living with his stepmother, okay, in a de facto relationship. The error the church had made appears to be that they believed that God was so forgiving that even that was forgivable. Therefore, they were trying to glorify God by having all these ridiculous things happening and it being acceptable. Why? Because it glorified God and they had to be corrected. Why were they thinking on these terms initially? Because the city of Corinth had the temple of Diana there and she, she was a, a goddess of love and every known physical uh, enjoyment of a sexual nature was permissible in this place. It didn't matter what variety of colour you were of the six colours of the rainbow, um, it was all acceptable. So there was this underlying belief that physical pleasure was part of worship and that all things were acceptable, but they had standards. That's why I went on to say, not even the Gentiles are doing this. 
You've gone even outside of their moral code, but they thought it was okay because they believed that it was either perhaps it was so evil that their God was so good that even that was forgivable, or they believed that they had a ticket to freedom and it didn't really matter. But it really doesn't matter. They were corrected. But the reason I put this verse in is because the definition of fellowship here is being gathered together in the spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ being present. And this is what happens today. The power of God is here on top of us being spirit filled on top of us. And this is what multiplies the benefit of fellowship. There's things to be done, people to be spoken to, thoughts to think. And getting together is often the healer of the problems of life. When we gather in fellowship, many of the sicknesses, I gave example of people who are sick. They overcame their terminal disease. They had multiple years. We've had others who have permanently been healed, but it really didn't matter. The point was that while they saw fellowship as a key to God's blessing, they fellowshiped. They fellowshiped. They got to where the people were. And these verses are talking about the similar thing. Gather where the people are. Serve each other, forsaking not the assembly of ourselves together. Even more so, when you see the day approaching, if we sin willfully, what is the sin? The sin is not believing God. Not believing God and doing what we think. And he said, well, how, how is this going to work? Well, we'll get on to that. I could read a little bit more, but I'll go to verse 8 here because I want to bring this word feast in. Even though I'm not going to do the talk on it now, I want to bring this concept of feast. Why? Because it was part of the Old Testament. This is why they referred to the word feast. Uh, in the book of Jude, it talks about love feasts. Earlier, or a little bit later, uh, it talks about you cannot eat the, the, from the table of the of devils when you can eat at the Lord's table. And there's a reference back to uh, the, uh, Isaiah 28, where he talks about with stammering lips and other tongue, but he also speaks about the tables are full of vomit leading into that. The tables are full of vomit, meaning that the Lord's table, everything which is good to eat wasn't on it, which is everything that was rejected. Vomit is just rejection from body. Everything which is rejected by the body of Christ was on the table. Everything God didn't want them to hear or say or do was on the table. So this is why I talked about going the other way and eating the feast that the Lord prepared, which is symbolic of fellowshipping for the right reason in the context we're looking at today. Verse 8. Therefore, conclusion. You can work it out yourself, what he's concluding to. You can get your own context at home. But he says, therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of what? Sincerity and truth. Understanding what the Lord says, understanding what the Lord means, and actually living within it. Now I've got that little bit sort of set and we're in the book of Corinthians. So let's go to chapter 11 because this is just a remarkable context to put these packages together in a way which is helpful for all of us. 1 Corinthians 11, 27. And it gives us the ability to explain ourselves. Quite often families say, oh, all you ever do, the church comes first, you do this, you do that. I say, no, the church never comes first in my life. God comes first in my life. Okay, God comes first and the church is where God gathers. So I don't allow them to twist it around any more than I allow them to say that what you're saying is if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. What I'm saying is no, we're not saying that at all. What we're saying is if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. Tongues is the evidence of the Holy Spirit. It's the spirit that saves, not the tongue. They twist it and it makes it sound like you've got some little trivial belief that somehow is greater than the rest of the Bible. And that's not what we believe. We believe that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you've got nothing. But they, they try and disempower the argument and we won't fall for it. So we, we say it correctly. Verse 11, sorry, verse 27, 1 Corinthians 11. Wherefore, oh, here we go. Wherefore, it's a conclusion. Fancy that. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink the cup of the Lord, this is the feast, this is the fellowship, unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let's have a think about this one for a moment. He who eats and drinks unworthy, it's not that they're at home. Okay, he's talking about the ones that are there. You can't eat and drink if you're not there. And if you're thinking in terms of communion as in bread and grape juice, 
You can't take this if you're not here. So he who eats and drinks unworthily, not those who don't do it, okay, definition, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. This is not about whether you take the elements or not, it's whether you eat and drink unworthily. How? How in the world can you take these two elements and eat them and drink them so badly that it's a condemnation to yourself and you, how can you eat and drink that so badly that you're guilty of the blood of the Lord? Physically impossible. Even if you eat, like some of the people I've had meals with here, and you drivel and slobber. I'm not looking at anyone, Ty. But it doesn't matter how bad you eat and drink, that is not the message. The message is, it's a spiritual message. You forsake the assembling of yourselves together. This is what this is about. This is about not being there. But the interesting thing is, if you eat and drink unworthily, you've got the Holy Spirit now, therefore you're eating and drinking of the Lord every day of your life. This is what we need to grasp. Sunday and the meeting we have here is not the beginning and the end of our fellowship. All right, it might be the primary day of fellowship because of time and days off and things like that. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But our calling isn't to turn up on Sunday and take two elements and somehow think we've righteously achieved God's goal. We're here to walk in the Lord. We're here to serve each other. We're here to know what God wants. Overcomers have a resurrection. The saved don't have a resurrection. The overcomers have a resurrection. You can't be resurrected if you're not saved. So we have this process of understanding the first choice we make, repent, be baptised, receive the Holy Spirit. The second choice we have is we walk in that spirit because that's where the overcoming is. Now we have these descriptions about what it means to walk in the Lord. And walking in the Lord is not turning up on Sunday and having these elements on their own. But you don't have to be a fanatic you don't have to be down on your knees praying five and six hours every day, reading your Bible for two hours. That is not what is being said. <coughs> There's an opportunity. Some of us are not good readers. Some of us are not good witnesses. Some of us are not good at anything. But we can still be part of the friendship of the church people. We can still contact people. And in an age with iPads, phones, you name it, we've got the best contact opportunities ever brought. <coughs> and we're doing it. So, let's go back to this verse. For he, verse 29, what's it say? This is a summary. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, this is according to God's standard, not ours, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Why? Because they're not discerning they're not comprehending the Lord's body, which is the spirit-filled people. The Lord's body is not the dead body on the cross. And it's not the body that now sits on the right hand of God. The communion of elements are, this is my body, which is broken for you. He traded his body for the body of Christ, which was the church. They didn't understand that spirit-filled people, the fellowship, uh, where the servitude was to be headed primarily with the secondary level of witnessing, go, go, Mark 16, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. That was the secondary. When you're at home with your, your wife and kids and you've got your family, your family comes first, then the additions come after. It's no good being witnessing on the streets when your kids are starving. You've got a responsibility to feed your children. You've got a responsibility to give them a safe house to be in and you've got a responsibility to make sure that they're clothed and cared for. First responsibility is the household of God. Love begins, charity begins with the household of God. It's the same principle. So when we start moving into these verses, we realise there's far more than what we might have understood. And some people say, well, look, fellowship's an option. I say, no, fellowship's everything. Fellowship's everything. Because this is where the Lord's able to achieve all the goals. I can go through a list, and I'm not using this as a judgment, I can go through a list, but one thing I've noticed is that the more fellowship people get, the terminally ill get a lot longer life than the people who don't fellowship. Very clearly, 
they get a lot longer life because they set the example. That's how it works. God gives them something. And to be so ill, and again, I know there's people who are genuinely ill, and I'm not taking away from that. If you choose, when you could be at a meeting and you choose not to, then you've got a difficulty. And that's it. when it's a way of life, not just a one-off, when it's a way of life, then you've got to start thinking differently. This is why these verses are there. And he goes on to say, let's read verse 29, because now there's a context. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And because of this reason, verse 30, conclusion. For this cause, many are what? Weak. Many are sickly among you, and many sleep. Many, many have died, or many have gone to sleep and they're walking the Lord. There's both a physical and natural. I don't care which one you go because the principle doesn't change. When you choose that the fellowship's not for you, ultimately you become weak, you become sick, and you'll go to sleep and you'll walk in the Lord, whichever way. And this is where, when you're asleep at the wheel, it means I love the Lord, I know the Lord, I believe everything the Lord says, but I don't do too much. You're asleep. If that's how you are, you're asleep at the wheel. You can't take away from that. The scriptures define it so clearly. He says in verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, this is what this is about us judging us, not judging others. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged, meaning that there's no judgment in the future from God. Why? Because we've already done it. We've already moved to a place where God can bless us without any conviction. Why? Because he washes away our sin. He keeps us clean. This is what fellowship achieves. It keeps this purity flowing as a byproduct of being where the Lord's people are. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Why does the Lord do this? Because he doesn't want us to have to face judgment. I think sometimes it's good for the doctor to say, look, if you don't give up drinking, you're going to die. He doesn't say that to be judgmental. He gives you that information so you don't have to die, not as a judgment, so you will die. He gives it as a reversal of fortunes so you can turn life around. Wherefore, again, another conclusion, verse 33, wherefore, my brethren, when you come together, eat, tarry, which means wait, uh, tarry for one another, wait for one another. And if any man hungers, let him eat at home that you might not come together in condemnation. And he says, and the rest I'll tell you. So again, I could spend 15 minutes, I won't, on explaining the difference between eating as in the communion as a meal, a physical meal, versus the spiritual content. He simply said, don't eat together. And yet we're supposed to eat the Lord's meal together. Why? Because one is spiritual and one is natural. Doesn't mean we can't have a dinner night, we can't do this, we can't do that. We're very good at catering and doing those things. But that is not what communion in this context, overcoming communion is about. Yes, it's a meal. Yes, it's food. Yes, it's to be eaten and offered and identified by God. But it's a spiritual content which is to be applied, not the natural. That's all the Lord wanted us to understand. When we come, as we do today, there's nothing wrong with the bread and the grape juice. They're only identifiers to put your heart into what you really stand for. The bread, little wafer, it's nothing like what they ate on the table, but we're not allowed to eat a meal. But it's symbolic. It's the body. The grape juice is the blood, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. We've got the body and we've got the Holy Spirit. And when we're together, Miracles and great things happen. And this is all Paul wanted the church to know. When you get together, there's something happening together that does not happen when you're on your own. And it can't happen when you're on your own. It's different, but it's God's plan. So we're asked to encourage. And to sort of conclude, when you go back through the parable, and we're not going to read it, just a reference, the parable of the sheep and the goats, both clean animals, both were animals of sacrifice acceptable to God, so it's not a, an unsaved and a saved situation. I won't explain all that again, 15 more minutes. The reason why the goats were rejected by God is very clear. 
They said, Lord, when were you hungry? When were you thirsty? When were you naked? When were you in any form of distress that I never came and met your need? Simple answer was, when you do this not to the least of these little ones, you've done it not unto me. Can you see how this all ties together? That is the same principles as the communion. It's exactly the same about considering one another to provoke it unto love and good works. There's another verse that says, brethren, above all things have fervent charity one for another. Above all things. It means, in my language, above everything else, every other priority. These are there, not to motivate us to feel, ah, oh, I should have got one more meeting, or, or they're, they're there saying, this is the principle which I bring my blessing forward. Why don't you take steps into the principle? Move into where the food is. Go to where the Lord's working. Don't go through the rubbish bins of life looking for food. Go to where God's got the smorgasbord. Because this world, the natural world, is a rubbish bin of life. In the end, it's rejected. It's never going to be acceptable. But the Lord's food, about to feast, the communion concept, our fellowship, is feasting on the power of the Lord. That's why it's called the power fellowship. All the people said, Amen. We'll leave it there.